Just when it looked as though there might be an end in sight to the strikes, now passport staff are walking out, and this time for five weeks. For those waiting for passports to get away, it could mean frustrating delays. I believe our health workers deserve proper pay, just like our firefighters and our teachers. What the government's doing for its own workforce is treating them worse than anyone else and not putting any substantial offers on the table, and that's unacceptable. There has been progress elsewhere, though. Teaching unions are starting intensive talks and NHS staff have a new pay offer. We will have all the strike latest. Also this lunchtime, Harry versus the press. The Duke of Sussex live election against the Mail on Sunday is back in the courts. It's Gold Cup Day at the Cheltenham Festival. ITV Racing's Ed Chamberlain will bring us the favourites and... One surfer's triumphant 40-hour battle with the waves. Yeah, it's awesome. It's so good. Nice one, baby. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everyone. You're the best. This is the ITV Lunchtime News with Romilly Weeks. Good afternoon. If you thought the prospect of an end to the long-running NHS strikes by nurses and ambulance workers would trigger a new era of industrial relations, think again. With the Easter break and summer holidays on the horizon, workers at passport offices have escalated their action and will go on strike for five weeks in their dispute about pay and conditions. Our political reporter Amy Lewis on the passengers who could be grounded as the industrial action takes off. Another wave of strikes, this time affecting holidaymakers hoping to jet off this summer. First there was Covid, then cancellations because of airport staff shortages and now passengers face further delays. That's really appalling, yeah. Terrible for so many people. Yeah. How, uh, how will it affect you? Will it affect you at all? Well, yeah, I want to uh, go abroad. Uh, I want to go to, to Greece and I can't then. They need to do what they need to do to get their money. Well, will that affect us on the holiday plans? It could do, yeah. What do you think about people striking? I think they need to get back to work. More than a 1,000 passport office workers will walk out between the 3rd of April and May 5th during the spring holiday season. Easter falls between the 7th and 10th of April and the early May bank holiday falls on the 1st of May. Their union says it is taking action because the government has refused to increase its 2% pay rise. We have the lowest paid workers in the public sector. Do you know there are over 50,000 civil servants are on the national minimum wage now? 40,000 using food banks. What would you say to the people whose holidays are potentially disrupted this summer? What I'd say is that if they're angry, they should take that up with the government. Because I think most people would be shocked to know that the people who are issuing the passports are so lowly paid, many of them can't afford to go on holidays. At peak times, including when the strike is happening in April, the passport office can receive 250,000 applications a week. Check your passport now if you're planning to go on holiday over Easter, half term in May, um, over the summer, and see if it needs renewing. But bear in mind that the worst thing that can happen is that everyone panics and applies for their passport now, um, and that causes a bottleneck even before the strike has begun. A Home Office spokesperson told us they are engaged in constructive talks with the union and are working to put contingency plans in place. But for passengers, the strikes potentially mean months of misery. And Amy is at Westminster this lunchtime. Amy, an escalation of the passport strikes then, but where are we with the other big disputes as well? Well, if we start with teachers in England, it's appeared to be stalemate on this one now for weeks because the government had refused to meet the unions unless they called off their strikes. And yet, for example, the National Education Union, who were on strike with teachers in England for the last couple of days, had refused to call off their strike. And so, as I say, it had been stalemate. But now, all of a sudden, there seems to be quite a major breakthrough, a 
joint statement was put out this morning between the government and four of the teaching unions saying that as of today they're going to start intensive talks that are expected to last over the weekend and those talks will be about pay and working conditions. Now as part of the agreement to have those intensive talks the National Education Union has agreed that they will not be announcing any more strike action in the next fortnight. And when it comes to the NHS and junior doctors, are we expecting more talks this afternoon? Well, last night, the British Medical Association, the union that represents uh, junior doctors, uh, sent an open letter to the Health Secretary, Steve Barclay, requesting talks as early as today. I have spoken to a government source in the last hour or so who has said that it will not happen that quickly. But I have been told by that government source that Steve Barclay is keen to meet with the BMA, and that could happen as early as next week. Of course, earlier this week, uh, junior doctors went on strike for three days. The British Medical Association Associations say that they want to see a 35% pay increase. Uh, they say it needs to be that high because of the cuts that have, uh, they've seen in recent years. Previously, D Steve Barclay has said that that is not affordable. It is way above inflation. But clearly now the fact that Steve Barclay, we've been told, does want to meet the BMA means that, again, there could be some movement on this one next week, which would, of course, be of relief to uh, patients. Let's hope so. Amy in Westminster, thank you. So where are we with the other planned strikes? RMT members at 14 train companies will stage three further 24-hour strikes tomorrow and on the 30th of March and 1st of April. Driving examiners will hold six further days of industrial action this month, starting next Monday. And Environment Agency workers are walking out from 7 p.m. tonight until 7 on Monday morning and then from 24th to the 27th of March. Murderers with a history of coercive behaviour towards their victims or who use extreme violence could face tougher sentences under new government plans. As part of the proposals, judges would have to consider these as aggravating factors when jailing killers. Lewis Warner now on the proposed changes and the reaction to them. Natalie was just full of life. From the outside looking in, they just looked like a happy family. Six years ago, Joanne's sister was killed by her partner. Natalie Hemming was subject to years of coercive control, a pattern of assault, threats and humiliation for which the government says perpetrators should face harsher punishments. Yes, absolutely. We need, we need much, much tougher sentences for the people that commit these crimes. We absolutely do need support services, but we need to be preventing these crimes happening in the first place. So for me, it feels like we need to be looking further back. A review into domestic abuse cases in England and Wales found around 26% of all homicides are committed by a current or former partner or a relative. More than half of cases reviewed involved controlling or coercive behaviour. While excessive violence, called overkill, was identified in 60% of cases, all but one of them committed by men. The suffering that women face, particularly in domestic murder cases or, mur or homicide cases, is not properly reflected in the amount of time that the male perpetrators spend behind bars. And I want women across the country to know that the full strength of the criminal justice system is there to protect them. The government says judges will be told to treat a killer's previous behaviour as an aggravating factor when sentencing. But the report's author isn't satisfied. My concern is unless you adopt all of the recommendations that we've made in the report, there will still be an adverse effect on uh, a few women who um, end up in a situation where they, um, they kill an abusive partner. They will not benefit from the concept of uh, the model of coercive and controlling behaviour being um, a mitigating feature. The specific details of the plans are expected to be revealed in the summer, but some loved ones already feel they'll be left wanting more. Lewis Warner, ITV News. Prince Harry's latest battle against the press is taking place at the High Court today. The Duke of Sussex lawyers are in court over an article in the Mail on Sunday about his security arrangements. Rebecca Barry has been listening to the evidence and joins me now. Rebecca, take me through what's been said. Well, Prince Harry was not at court today, but this is one of several of his legal battles against British newspapers. 
The Duke of Sussex is suing the publisher of the Mail on Sunday over an article about a legal challenge of his security arrangements when he's in the UK. Now, just for background, uh, separate, entirely separate from this case, Prince Harry is challenging a Home Office decision that he and his family won't receive the same degree of security protection when they visit here from the US. Lawyers for Harry say that an article published in the Mail on Sunday in February last year made defamatory claims about his willingness to pay for his UK security. Associated newspapers, the publisher, uh, are contesting this claim. Now, last year, the judge ruled in Prince Harry's favour in the first part of this claim, and uh, legal proceedings were paused so that the, uh, both sides could try and reach a settlement. That didn't happen, so today, Prince Harry's lawyers are asking the judge to rule in his favour and avoid the need to proceed to a full trial. Uh, um, Aside from this legal action, Prince Harry is pursuing uh, several other cases uh, for far more serious allegations of invasions of privacy against newspapers. And as we all know, he has made very clear his anger towards the British press. Now, it seems, that is being played out in the British courts. Rebecca at the High Court, thanks for that. Police Constable Mary Ellen Betley Smith has been found guilty of gross misconduct for using excessive force when she struck former footballer Dalian Atkinson with a baton. The ex Aston Villa player died in August 2016 after being kicked at least twice in the head by PC Betley Smith's colleague, PC Benjamin Monk, outside his father's home in Telford. Betley Smith used unnecessary, disproportionate, and unreasonable force by striking Mr. Atkinson with her police baton a disciplinary panel has found. The Court of Appeal has ruled there should be a fresh inquest into the death of a disabled woman who took her own life after her benefits were cut. Jodie Whiting from Stockton died in 2017, about two weeks after her disability benefit was stopped when she didn't attend a work capability assessment. Her mother took her case to the Appeal Court and today a judge said the public has a legitimate interest in knowing whether her death was connected with the abrupt removal of her benefits. And Aldi has given its workers another pay rise to £11.40 an hour, an increase of about 13%. This comes only two months after the supermarket handed a pay increase to its more than 40,000 staff members. It's the final day of one of horse racing's most prestigious events, the Cheltenham Festival, and the crowning glory today, the Gold Cup. The bookies will, of course, be winners, but which horses and jockeys will be romping home? ITV Racing's Ed Chamberlain is there with all the build-up. Welcome to Cheltenham on Boodle's Gold Cup Day, one of the biggest days in our sport. And already we have had quite some week. We've had everything, really. We've had bad luck, good luck, Irish winners, British winners. We've had emotion. We've had brilliant, brilliant performances, none better than Constitution Hill on day one. Hands and heels. It was so easy for Nico de Boinville, and thankfully we haven't had to talk about the whip at all. No hint of a disqualification yet going into the final day. But we've just had tears and so much emotion. Those scenes with Honeysuckle on day one are scenes at Cheltenham that you see very, very rarely. And we might get more today because Rachel Blackmore could win the Gold Cup. Yesterday she was in winning form again. She was with Jack de Bromhead, who died so tragically last September at the age of 13. She was with his sisters in the winner's enclosure. There wasn't a dry eye in the house. She is the best ambassador this sport could ever wish for. And last year on Aplutar and the Gold Cup, she and the horse were breathtaking and they're back for more. They might win the Cheltenham Gold Cup at half past three this afternoon in a race that is just packed full of really good stories because Gallup and Deshaun might be absolutely brilliant. We've got a former Grand National winner. We've got a strong British challenge. We've got one horse called Hewick who cost 800 quid and he's already won round the world. I promise you it's going to be a spectacular final day here at the Cheltenham Festival. Ed Chamberlain there, and our coverage from Cheltenham follows the news on ITV1, ITVX and STV. And staying with sport, it'll be a difficult trip for Chelsea in the Champions League, having drawn holders Real Madrid in the quarter-finals. The Spanish giants knocked the two-time winners out at the same stage last season. 
Meanwhile, title chasing Manchester City will also have their work cut out for them up against German champions Bayern Munich. This morning's Alison Hammond is heading for the Bake Off tent. Where's the door going? <coughs> oh. <laughs> the presenter will replace Matt Lucas as co-host following her memorable appearance on the celebrity version of the show. She competed against singer James Blunt and presenter Alex Jones in a Stand Up to Cancer special. The star had hoped to impress the judges with her brownies, but Judge Paul Hollywood said her biscuits looked like they'd been made by a five-year-old. She tweeted this morning, I'm so very excited, I'm so very happy, and I can't <laughs> wait to get started. <laughs> and finally, to the shattered surfer, shattering world records, Blake Johnston took to the seas off the coast of Sydney for an impressive 40 hours, an extreme challenge which came with risks to his health, including infections, deafness and jellyfish stings. Sharon Thomas now on the man riding the waves. Catching his final wave, number 707, after a mammoth 40-hour record-breaking surf. Exhausted and emotional, but all worth it. Just look at those crowds. A quick hug and kiss from his wife and children. But after two days in the water, Blake Johnston was understandably wiped out. His super long surf began at 1 a.m. yesterday Australian time, a floodlight guiding him in dark seas off Sydney's Cronulla Beach. Wave after enormous wave, the 40-year-old surf coach just kept on catching them. The support unwavering. Sydney has been hit with a heat wave, 27 degrees today, so it was tough going out there. He also faced the prospect of blindness, infection, dehydration, as well as jellyfish and shark attacks. But as dawn broke, came the news that the 40-year-old had smashed the record for the world's longest surf session of 30 hours and 11 minutes. Yeah, it's awesome. It's so good. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. You're the best. He did it to raise a quarter of a million pounds for mental health charities after his father took his own life. And after setting the record, he went back in, plunging into the Pacific for another 10 hours, after which he admitted he was cooked. But wow, what an awesome Aussie. Sharon Thomas, ITV News. What a feat. That is it this lunchtime. The news where you are follows the national weather from everyone here. Goodbye.